good morning, and I really am quite delighted to be here for more than one reason. I was very interested to hear from Mr. Kothari that, uh, very, that, that this institute has something like 50-50 gender balance. Having been on the boards of various institutes of management in Bangalore and Lucknow, MDI and so on, we have tried for years to increase the number of women in the institutes and we really not succeeded too well because we've gone to about 30, at the most 35. While here, you've almost reached 50. Uh, and I think in this program, it's 51, which is a tremendous achievement. I'm not saying that only because I like looking at women. Uh, <laughs> all men do. Uh, but more importantly, that the country needs to respect and to build the ability of women uh, because uh, through education. Uh, because if you look at all the exam results around the country, in public exams, in public service exams, banking entrance exams, and so on, it is women who do best. And yet, uh, they haven't really gone very far in business. There are not too many women managers. And I think, therefore, the fact that you've got so many women is a tremendous achievement. And uh, I must congratulate Mr. Kothari and the Institute uh, for having got so far. The other reason is something that I saw in the folder that was given to me, which was the number of high ratings that the Institute has enjoyed. I'm afraid I was not aware of this, and I'm really delighted. I congratulate the faculty and the director and the managing director for having brought the Institute uh, to this uh, high level. And let's remember, never in an institution is it the faculty that build an institution, it is the students. It is the quality of the students, the interaction of the students with each other, the amount of effort they're willing to put in uh, that brings them where they are. So uh, that's another tremendous achievement, and I must congratulate the Institute on having come this far. I want to spend a few minutes, I'm told about 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> about looking at this whole issue of globalization and management. If you look at the global economy today, it is in bad shape. Uh, if you look at the developed economies of the world, they are to some extent in decline for more than one reason. Uh, one reason, of course, is demographics. All the countries, whether it's except for the United States, whether it's in Europe or Japan, uh, even China in the coming years, uh, are showing demographic trends which will mean a lot more people in the older ages than in the younger ages. Uh, India has the great advantage of a very, very young population, uh, and in fact, is growing younger. Uh, and young people have great deal more energy, great deal more dynamism. One wouldn't say that by looking at the governance of India. Our prime minister is 80, and president is 79, and you know, you need to be in my age group in order to get there, which is a great shame. Uh, because I think we really need much younger people to be running this country, but that's a different debate. But we do have the advantage of a young population. The young population means greater energy, greater uh, productivity, uh, much greater ambition, the desire to do well, the desire to improve lives for themselves and the families, and that is therefore a tremendous advantage. But of course, as I've said many times before, the so-called demographic dividend for India uh, is a dividend and not a liability only with skills and education. And that is why it is so good uh, that institutions like this are looking at how to improve the quality, the caliber of our young population. The other reason why in the developed world things are going down is the, what, what I think is now being called climate change. Uh, climate change is going to compel developed economies to begin to change lifestyles. Uh, they consume huge quantities of energy. They have really spoiled the environment in the world with their emissions. Uh, of course, they tell us in China to cut emissions, but we, don't, we haven't done anything like the damage that these people have done. Uh, and as we go along, I think climate change is going to compel lifestyle changes in those countries. And those lifestyle changes will mean that uh, those economies are not doing as well 
uh, as they did in the past. As against this, India has a great advantage. We do have, as I said, a demographic advantage. We also have the advantage that while we are burning coal and we are contributing to climate change with our emissions, uh, it's not of any great significance. And as we go along, and as we're able to get into nuclear energy, as we're able to increase the amount of solar energy that we use, uh, we would be able to do better. Of course, there are problems. Problems caused by many years of socialism, uh, many years of public ownership of the major resources of India, coal, uh, oil, gas, uh, either owned directly by government or owned by people who control government in the private sector. So even though despite that, uh, the, the energy requirements of India are going to go up, we have to find ways to deal with it, and we will. We always find solutions to problems. So India has this great advantage. The other great advantage that we have is an enormous domestic market. We have a huge domestic market. And that domestic market is going to serve us in good stead in spite of what happens in the rest of the world. Now, these are all the nice things to think about India. We have serious problems. I did refer to one in terms of governance. Our governance, our political leadership needs to do far better than it has. Uh, it, is, it, is in, it, is, it is inclusive for themselves, not inclusive for the rest of us. It takes care of itself. It does not take care of the country. Uh, it does not do the things that it should do. It does not work in a coordinated fashion. It's for us, those of us who are voters, those of us who have influence on policy, who can push uh, to try and do something about this. But having, despite all the negatives that we can think of for India, India still has the possibility or the certainty of a great future. We might not do well for a year, two years, or three years, uh, because Mulayam Singh, let us say, becomes Prime Minister of India, uh, or something like that happens in the coming year, or the Congress continues to behave in the way it is doing. But all these are temporary, they're short term. The basic fact remains that the country is strong. Now, it is in this context that we need to look at the challenge to young managers. Because when you're in management, you are working in corporations that may not themselves directly be involved in the global economy, but they're certainly very much influenced by the global economy. An increasing number of companies are also beginning to go abroad. They're investing abroad. They're looking at markets abroad. Uh, in many companies, we have competition from citizens abroad. You go to Infosys, for example. There are a substantial number of people who are employed uh, who have been recruited from other countries in the world. Go to Mysore, to their uh, uh, training center, and you see this. Uh, and this is not true just of uh, uh, Infosys, it's true of many other larger companies in India. So we are talking about a situation where there is tremendous competition within the country for good jobs. There's a tremendous competition between organizations, between companies. There is competition not only within, but competition from without. Uh, and it is in that context that you, as managers, will have to function. Uh, when I joined as a management trainee in Hindustan Lever, something like 60 years ago, uh, they didn't have institutes of management. They interviewed 10,000 people to pick one. So it's a huge job. Today, the institutions like this do the filtering. And their companies are able to recruit much more easily without having to go through that huge rigmarole of seeing thousands of people in order to pick one. But having picked that person, that person also has to remember that he, she has to develop themselves. If they don't, uh, then they're going to fall by the wayside because this is a world of tremendous competition. Before we came into this uh, hall, we were talking about the financial markets and the new governor of the Reserve Bank of India, who is one of the most brilliant economists in the world at the age of 50 who was a professor of economics in Chicago in his late 20s, early 30s, who was the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund in his very early 40s. Absolutely remarkably brilliant academic career. Now he's the Ghana Reserve Bank. He wrote a paper in 2005 where he predicted the kinds of things that happened that, are going, that were going to happen uh, because of the unbridled growth of financial products and the very, very poor regulation. Uh, of these financial institutions. And sure enough, in 2008, 
we had a collapse. We had a collapse. The Americans had to spend vast sums of money uh, to rescue some of these companies and to rescue the economy. And they're still not out of the woods. That disease has spread to Europe. Uh, Japan went through similar problems for 10 years. It is now beginning to hoping, hopefully coming out of it. We are going through similar problems. But our problems are not necessarily just because of the world. They're also because of our own mismanagement. But having said that, Whatever happens in the world is going to affect us. And you, therefore, have to be wide awake to the world uh, to see what is going on in other countries, to what is going on in other markets, what is going on in financial markets, in technology, in innovation, and so on. And this is where I think self-learning, self-development, on a continuing basis, till you stop working, any after you stop working, uh, is essential. You have to keep learning. What are the kinds of things you need to keep learning? India has, gives us a great advantage. We are a multiracial, multicultural, multilingual country. We are used, accustomed in our daily life to deal with a variety of people. We don't have the same kind of person everywhere. The same color, the same language, the same background, the same religion. We have so many different people to deal with. We learn how to deal with people like this. We also very few of us, I'm sure in this room, I can bet that there must be very few who do not speak at least three languages. Your mother tongue, your English, and Hindi. Probably more. How many countries in the world have populations that pick up languages like that? And we pick them up when we're children. And therefore, when we go out into the world, into the global economy, we enjoy an advantage. Because the ability to pick languages up is something that is now built into us. It's wired into us. It is now part of our DNA. That's one kind of advantage. But it doesn't stop there. When you work with companies or compete with companies abroad, you have to understand their culture, their background, their motivations. And if you don't understand that, you could get into trouble in other markets, even in your own market. You take the example of what has been going on in India in the uh, uh, automotive business. The, if you look at Japanese companies, Japanese companies at one time used to dominate the entertainment business in India, in television, in record players, in all that. Today they don't. Who dominates? It's Korea. Both Japan and Korea have similar racial characteristics. But Japanese companies have come into India, and very rarely, practically not, they have had chief executives or Indians uh, who can speak English, who can talk to the labor force, who can talk to the workforce. The Koreans, by and large, have been exactly the opposite. They're also a very difficult lot. They're also very tough. But they have understood that when you go into a society, you need to have people who can communicate with that society. We have the advantage. We can pick it up. But here, the Koreans have done it. And you can see how they have, in the last five or six years, taken over markets from cell phones and television sets to cars and everything else. Therefore, we have to learn that. But when we go abroad, when we go to markets, or we run companies abroad, we work in companies abroad, we need to be able to understand local cultures, local practices. Now that takes me to the third thing. Uh, I was saying to our friends here on the platform that I wrote a book many years ago on negotiation. Uh, and in that, I had to do a lot of studying on cross-cultural negotiations. How do you deal with people in, from Japan what are the characteristics? How do you deal with others and so on? And one beautiful story, which may not be applicable today at that time, was how when an American chief executive came for a meeting in Japan, uh, he had provided three days. And at the airport, he was received by a large entourage. Everybody was very, very helpful. They took his uh, ticket, and they said, we'll get it reconfirmed, and so on. And then they entertained him. They took him to the Ginza. They went, him, went all over the place, had a nice nightlife. And this poor chap is beginning to wonder, I come here for business, what is happening? And it was only on the last day, when he was due to leave, that they began to talk business. Uh, and this chap had a time pressure. The Japanese knew that perfectly well, and they put that time pressure on him. It's a story, maybe not applicable today. But what I'm trying to tell you is that in your negotiating with other people, you need to make sure that they are not taking advantage of you and your weaknesses, your cultural weaknesses try and understand their culture, their practices. Uh, this is a world where information is 
instantly available with the internet, with Wikipedia. Uh, you can do all kinds of research. I'm sure many of you students must be using all these things. And uh, I hope your faculty is able to find out which of them is actually original, which of them is just copied. But we have access to huge amounts of information. But in work, when you go to work, you will find that today's world of companies gives you instant data on what is going on in the company. Because of the things like Oracle or SAP and many other things, you are able to access information in the most detailed form, if you wish. And that makes managing much more easy. It also has eliminated, to a great extent, a lot of middle management. Uh, because the work of the middle management is now being done through the computer and through these various programs. Therefore, all that I can tell you is that you have to learn. You are constantly learning. Uh, you have to prepare yourself. And your, pre your, your preparation is a lifetime of preparation, not just these two years. Uh, this is only the beginning. It's telling you the kinds of things you need to learn. But you need to keep learning. And if you do, I have no doubt at all that with the institute and your own capability and your self-learning, you'll go very, very far. I wish you all the luck. I'm delighted to inaugurate this program. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you.